All right. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for these students. The weekend just completed. Help us uh, just to make the most of this time, Lord, for your glory. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So last time, I begun down the path of chapter 18 in Galilean. Um, so let me just pick up with an example. So let's consider 7, which is an element of z, adjoin the square root of my, uh, square root of 5. Not minus 5, but 5. All right, suppose that 7 is equal to x times y. All right. For some x and y in uh, this set of things. Again, remember this notation means a plus b root 5, such that a and b are integers. <clears throat> okay, so we can use the norm, which was multiplicative. Uh, so the norm of 7 should be the norm of x times the norm of y, which says that uh, 49 is equal to the norm of x times the norm of y. So if if x and y are not units, then that implies that the norm of x is equal to the norm of y is equal to 7. All right. So, <clears throat> um, how is that possible? Well, if there exists, you know, a plus b root 5 um, equal to x such that you know, the norm of a plus b root 5 is equal to 7. That would give us that the absolute value of a squared minus 5b squared was equal to equal to 7, right? Or we can trade that for a squared minus 5b squared equal to plus or minus 7, okay? Now, the question is, is that possible? Well, that integer equation is kind of a pain to think about, but it's much much uh, more fruitful to look at this, look at this mod 7. So um, if there is an integer solution, right, then that solution also has to descend to be a solution mod, mod 7. Um, so, okay, so look at this mod 7. That would be the equation a squared minus 5b squared equals to 0 mod 7, right? Then here's the part I won't show you. Explicit consideration of the cases. How many cases are there? Well, A and B both range over seven things, so there's 49 cases to check here in principle. But you can you could break it down a little bit further than that if you take advantage of the fact that those are squares, right? So like. 1 and 6 mod 7 are the same number up to a square, right? 1 squared is 6 squared because 6 is minus 1 mod 7, that sort of thing. So there are actually less cases than it first appears. But anyway, if you explicit consideration of all the cases implies that A and B must both be 0, all right? Again, mod 7. So what's that mean? So if A and B are both 0 mod 7, that means that X equals to a plus b root 5 um, is congruent to 0 mod 7. Or therefore, x, in other words, 7 divides x. All right. <clears throat> Actually, more to the point, um, let's see here. That's not the way to I mean, that's true, but what I really wanted to get at was... Um, this has 7 divides A and 7 divides B, right? Thus, if you look at that, check this thing out here, right? A squared minus 5B squared is what? Is divisible by what? I mean, if, if, if A is divisible by 7, A squared is divisible by 49, right? If b is divisible by 7, then b squared is divisible by 49. 
You have the sum, I mean, you have the difference of things that's divisible by 49. So in total, a squared minus 5b squared is divisible by 49, right? Which implies that the norm of x is, divide, is, is divisible by 49, right? But can you have, is 7 divisible by 49? It is not, right? So that's impossible. So therefore, no such a comma b and z exist. And what do we conclude? We conclude that if you have the number 7 and z adjoining the square root of 5, um, if you can factor it into x times y, at least one of those factors must be a unit, right? Which is to say that 7 is irreducible in this set of numbers, right? All right. Theorem. Um, in an integral domain, um, every prime is an irreducible. All right, this marker's done. Yeah. Oh well. I need to practice more. Here. Okay, so proof. Um, suppose A um, in D is prime, where D is an integral domain. All right. Then what? So if um, if we have that a is equal to x times y, what's our goal? Our goal is to show, right, that if you factor a into a product of things in the domain, that one of those things is a unit, right? That's what it takes for it to be irreducible, right? The only possible factorizations in some sense are those that are not interesting, all right? So if a is equal to x times y, what do we get from the fact that it's prime? Prime says then that um, a divides x or a divides y, right? So suppose we look at this case. Consider a divides x, then what? That means x is equal to a times b, right, for some b in the domain, All right, ow, in other words, x is a multiple of a, and what does that say? So look at this, then here's a simple equation you can write, x times 1 is equal to x, all right, well that's not terribly shocking, um, but x is also equal to a times b, right, and what can we say about a? Well, a is equal to xy, right? But multiplication is associative, right? So you can rewrite that as x times yb, right? I guess I should have said at the outset of this, a is not equal to zero, right? a equal to zero is not interesting, you know? Well, I said it was prime, so it's included in that, yeah. Anyway, a is not zero. Um, a not being zero means in one of the things that it has co side consequence, x is not zero, right? If x were zero, that would contradict a being non-zero. <sighs> and we're in an integral domain, right? So what do you got? Yeah, cancellation. Ow. In particular, we have this and this. So that implies, since x is not zero, that 1 is equal to y times b. So therefore... Um, what do I after here? Y is a unit. All 
right? So if, if A divides X, that forces Y to be a unit. Well, guess what happens if, y div if, if A divides Y? Likewise, if A divides Y, that implies that X is a unit by the same argument, essentially. Consequently, we've shown that A is irreducible. In other words, prime implies irreducible in an integral domain. Right. Let's see here. Any, any questions before I go on? All right, well, um, <clears throat> let R um, be a commutative ring <coughs> with identity. Um, if A and B are associates, all right, then the principal ideal generated by A is equal to the principal ideal generated by B. Point number one. Point number two, if R is integral domain, um, then and I is equal to I is equal to the principal ideal generated by A, then um, if I is equal to the principal ideal generated by B, that implies that A and B are associates. So what I'm saying is that if you have associates, they generate the same principal ideal. That's generally true. And then in the context of an integral domain, in the context of an integral domain, if you want to find all possible generators for a given principal ideal, all you got to do is look at the associates of a given generator. This is in fact not true outside the context of an integral domain, but <laughs> the example of how two fails outside an integral domain is rather, rather involved. And like, I, know I talked to Bill about this a little bit. He's, he's under the opinion that it probably has to be an infinite, like an infinite dimensional example, an infinite example. You probably can't find counterexample in, in the finite world of finite rings. But anyway, um, haven't proved that, just talking. So here's the proof of one. What does it mean if A and B are associates? That means A is equal to B times U for some U um, in, in R with what? U, U prime equal to one for some U prime, right? And U is a unit, right? Just a point. Let's see here. So. Um, if I look at the principal ideal generated by A, what's it look like? It's R A such that R is an element of the ring, right? So how can you rewrite that? A is what? So we're looking at R B U such that R is in the ring, right? Or if you like, you could write this as um, B times RU, such that R is in the ring. And the question is, why is that everything, right? Well, here's one way you can argue. Um, this could definitely contains, it contains B, right? set R equal to U prime, where um, U prime U is equal to one, right? So this ideal contains B, but the smallest, um, the smallest ideal which contains B is exactly um, this thing. So once you know that this set is an ideal and it contains B, that forces it to be um, a subset of this thing. 
Well, actually, I mean, <laughs> it can't be smaller than that, so I think it has to be equal. I don't know. I mean, how do you want me to argue this? I have a more explicit argument in the notes, but basically, let me just forget this. But REU is arbitrary here, right? So if you think about it, you can hit anything in the ring with R times U, right? Um, if you want, um, anyway, so I'm going to stop talking. This is B. There's a slightly better argument in my notes, but I don't, eh, whatever. Now two, um, R is an integral domain, right? Suppose you have A equals to B, right? What's that mean? I think that would imply then that A is an element of this, right? Which would imply what? A is equal to, um, you know, B times R for some R in the ring. But what else do we know? We also have that um, B is an element of this, right? So we also have that B is equal to what? You know, A times R prime for some R prime, right? So if you just substitute one of these into the other, what do you get? A is equal to BR, but BR is what? It's A R prime R, right? Hence, R prime R is equal to one by cancellation, right? Or what else? I mean, there's cases to think about, I suppose. Either A is equal to zero, right? And that forces B equal to zero. That's one case. If A is not equal to zero though, then <clears throat> by cancellation, right, because A is what? A times one, right? So by cancellation, we get our, our prime is equal to one. Therefore, R and R prime are units, right? And what's that show? A equals to BR uh, shows A and B are associates. Right, next theorem. Yeah, well, I'll keep this one. Theorem. In a principal ideal domain, in a PID, an element is prime. If and only if it is irreducible. So half of that we've already done, right? This theorem I just erased part of the proof of is what? So proof. A prince, uh, an integral domain is what? Well, excuse me, a principal ideal domain is what? It's, a, it's an integral domain in which every ideal is principal. So a PID, a PID is automatically an integral domain by the definition, and consequently, this previous theorem, our previous theorem, provides what? Prime implies irreducible. So we should suppose um, you know, a an element of, let's give this thing a name. Let's call it D. Suppose A is an element of D, um, a, a principal ideal domain. Um, is what? Irreducible. So what do we want to show? We wish to show that A is prime. How do you show something's prime? Let 
we should suppose, consider, um, let's see, or assume that A divides B times C, all right? And then the proof here is really neat. Construct, what you do is you construct this, this I equal to sums. So what's it look like? AX plus BY such that X and Y is in the domain. All right, construct this set. And um, it's not hard to see, uh, I mean, I have the proof explicitly in the notes, but you can prove that's an ideal. It's easy to see the difference of such things is again such a thing. And also um, it's closed under, it's, it's, it's got the uber, uber closure like you want. Um, anyway, so that is an ideal. And since we're in a principal ideal domain, it has to be that this is equal to, you know, this is because I is an ideal in a PID. It has to be that it's a principal ideal. There has to be some element D which generates it, all right? So, <clears throat> Notice that A is equal to A times 1 plus B times 0. That's an element of I, right? Hence, A is an element of the principal ideal generated by D. And what's that mean? That implies that A is equal to R times D um, for some R in the ring. Okay. Now, we're trying to show uh, that irreducible implies prime, right? What's our goal? Our goal is to show either that A divides B or that A divides C, right? Now, if A is equal to RD, there are two cases, right? Since A is ir irreducible, what's that mean? There's two things that could happen here. Either R is a unit or D is a unit. Them's your choices, right? Since A is irreducible, that's a factorization of an irreducible. One or the other of those has to be a unit. So what then? This theorem I'm erasing is not in Galen, by the way. I added that because it seems important. You know, at least to the homework problems, there's so many homework problems where you're asked to figure out you know, how to get this principal ideal from a generator or something. It's nice to know kind of what are the connection between different possible generators. Well, I thought so anyway, but um, okay, so cases here. One, if D is a unit, then what? Then one is equal to D, D prime for some, you know, D prime in the ring. Then what? Excuse me. So one is equal to AX plus BY for somewhat X and Y um, in um, words, 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 a D. I mean, my point here is if one is equal to d times d prime, what's that say? One is an element of the ideal, right? If it's the ideal generated by d, d times d prime is definitely in there. So one is in there, which means that there exists x and y that when you multiply by a and b, you get back to one. But then what else we can do? Well, multiply this by c. We have c is equal to acx plus bcy. Now the reason I, I, I multiplied like that is there's a, there's a reason. So look at this. This is clearly divisible by A, right? Agree? A times CX divisible by A? I think we can agree. And we assumed at the outset of all this that A divides BC, right? So this, A divides BC. So you have a sum of two things divisible by A, that implies that this is in total divisible by, OK, 
can't do, I can't spell divisible by a, right? So, so therefore, a divides c. Great. That's one of the things we wanted to see, right? We were assuming a divides bc. Either we need to see a divides c or a divides b. So the consequence of d being a unit is acceptable. In fact, it's one of our, it's one of our desired outcomes, too. Um, what's the other case? R is a unit, right? If R is a unit, then what? A equals to RD is what? I said A equals to RD provides that A and R are associates, right? Then what? So by the theorem I just erased, and it's not in Galen, that implies that the ideal generated by A is equal to the ideal generated by R, right? And what's that say? Um, sorry, lost my track here. Uh, oh, I see. So, so thus. Huh. I say I is equal to the ideal generated by A in this case. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, R is a unit. Not A and R are associates. What should I say here? A and what are associates? I'm an, I'm an idiot. D. Yeah, 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 that makes more sense. Duh. <coughs> okay, the D is for duh. It's here. So, thus I is equal to A. Uh, ideal generated by A. And since B is an element, B is equal to what? Um, B is what? It's A times 0, right? Plus B times 1, that's an element of I, right? Which is generated by A, so that implies that B is equal to, you know, A times whatever you want, A prime. And so what's that say? A divides B, right? So the other case, case two, that R is a unit, leads us to the other possible path here for the prime is that A divides B. Either way we win, we have shown that irreducible implies prime. Es bueno? Si, okay. All right. <clears throat> I have some pictures in the next part I wanted to put up. Well, a picture, really. Come on. Oh, Jess, you're, uh, you're currently registered for algebraic topology. Sorry about that. I don't know. I told them to split it into two things, and they said split it into one one student one thing, and then three in the other. For some reason, they so so Cooper, you're in a class of your own at the moment. Yeah, I don't know. It's always an adventure. Always an adventure. Let's see here. I have, um, I took a few minutes to just go ahead and uh, put in all the definitions and, and theorems of the remaining chapters we're studying. Um, but I haven't added examples or proofs yet. But there, there's kind of a, a skeleton of the remaining two lectures in here already. Um, so the remainder of chapter 18, it's really pretty simple what it says. It says, Essentially, there's three interesting kinds of, of domains we look at. Principal ideal domains, I've already shown you kind of the main achievements here, right? In, in particular, in a principal ideal domain, every prime is, is irreducible, right? So, um, Bradley, not here, Hoogerwerf, um, this comment. Sorry, calling you out, Bradley. Uh, <laughs> I hope you're sick. No, wait a minute. No, I shouldn't hope that. But um, 
Anyway, so you know, a PID has this advantage of confusing the irreducibles and the primes. Right? There's, there's kind of no distinction there. Um, I mean, there is a distinction, right? Irreducible means that when you have a factoring of the element into two, sub, in, into two things, then one of those things is unit. Prime is a statement about divisibility, right? If, if, if something divides a product, a, if a prime divides AB, then either the prime divides A or the prime divides B. Or, or both. You know, I mean, you know, there's always this uh, mathematical ambiguity. So that's the one thing. The, the next kind of thing to study, the principal ideal domain, right? The next thing to study is this Euclidean domain notion. And so here's the definition for Euclidean domain. It's a little bit different than what's in Galen. If you want to... If you, you know, if you wanted to quote the definition of Galen, I'm fine with it. If this, this definition offends you and you prefer Galen's definition, go for it. It's cool. They're equivalent, I'm pretty sure. Um, D is a Euclidean domain if there's a norm. Remember, the norm, all that basically means is a function from the domain to the integers and zero. I mean, the positive, not non-negative integers, to be clear. And um, there's a division algorithm. So you pick any two elements in the ring, then uh, you can write you know, A is equal to the quotient times V plus the remainder, where this remainder is suitably small, as is measured by the norm. So in, uh, in Galen, he uses this function D from this to this, such that, and his, here's his condition for D, D of A is less than or equal to D of AB. That's the condition Galen gives us. Basically, his definition is exactly the same, except that instead of talking about a norm, he talks about a, a measure, all right? In the, I mean, in the context, I'm, one of the contexts I'm most interested in, if we have a multiplicative norm, they're not all multiplicative, um, then uh, you can easily prove that the multiplicative norm defines a measure because D of AB would be N of AB, but N of B is, is NA times NB. But if you just solve for, uh, solve for DA, you got DA is equal to DAB divided by DB. But this, if B is non-zero, is a number one, two, three, four, five, whatever. So clearly that fraction is at most D of AB and usually less. But you know, guys, let me not make this too abstract. For us, there are really three examples. Integers, algebraic integers, or things in the algebraic integers, essentially. Z adjoins square root of D or square root of minus D, these, these sorts of things. Um, and they're polynomials. That's pretty much our examples for here, as far as Euclidean domains go. For the polynomials, the degree function provides the norm. But um, for the algebraic integers, the this thing we started with today, the a squared minus 5b squared, that's the norm. It's the square. It's really the square of the, um, how to say this? Anyway, it's, it's this thing um, for, those, for these kinds of examples. Um, and then the integers, the norm is just the absolute value. That, that's pretty much it. But if you have a set which, which has a, a notion of distance, basically, a way of measuring the size of elements, and it permits a... Um, a division algorithm, then it's said to be a Euclidean domain. The integers are a Euclidean domain. Um, <laughs> there's an example. Dummett and Foote mentions that any field is a, is a Euclidean domain if you just define the norm to be zero on it. <clears throat> Whatever. Um, I mean, fine, but not really helpful here. Um, <laughs> so if we look at the integers, we define the norm to be the absolute value function. It's pretty easy to sh show that it's, it's multiplicative. Not surprising. What are the units? Well, if we have a multiplicative norm, we can find the units from looking at the solutions for the norm being one. Prove that last time. And so units and the integers, plus or minus one. That's it, right? And basically, this ambiguity leads to a corresponding ambiguity in the division algorithm that you probably haven't thought about. Because we're teach that, we teach the division algorithm, what's, is your remainder negative or positive? It has been drilled into your head that you choose a positive remainder, right? From the viewpoint of abstract algebra, this is just an ad hoc, ad hoc choice. Like, yeah, if I have 50 and I'm dividing by 8, I can look at, or excuse me, that's what, oh man, I changed this to 54, and I changed that to 54, but that is my residual 50, which was less interesting. 54, 54, 54. <laughs> you know, I, I, I tried to will it. I said all things are possible. My faith is not as a mustard seed. I'm sorry. I tried. But apparently that, I mean, I guess it wouldn't really glorify Christ if I could change that 0 to a 4, would it? Not particularly. So it's not surprising. I also don't have faith that I could do it. That's the other reason, you know? So all of these things. Hey, there's just some biblical integration for you right there. See here. So, um, 
in an integral domain, domain nonetheless. So 54 is 6 times 8, which is 48, plus 6, right? This is the traditional remainder. But also, 54 is 7 times 8, otherwise known as 56, to some children, minus 2. Not enough children, though. Not nearly enough. Maybe you guys can change that. Um, either work in the schools or marry smart people. I don't know. Your choice. But anyway. Um, so 56 minus 2 is 54. That's also a remainder. But it's a negative remainder, right? So this is not traditionally how we teach it. But the fact is, the division algorithm that I put forth in the definition of Euclidean domain allows for either remainder constituting a division algorithm. So the division algorithm is not unique. You have a choice. Positive remainder, negative remainder. In fact, this one's smaller, right? This is closer to the truth. 7 times 8 is closer to 54 than 6 times 8 is. In some sense, this negative remainder is a better remainder. You know? Just saying. If you have a field, you can define a norm by the degree function. It's not multiplicative, though, because the degree of a product is the sum of the degrees. And in fact, the units um, of the polynomials are the con non-zero constant polynomials. In other words, the degree zero things are the units. So you see, you can't always, you can't always assume that norm being one is going to give you units. It's true for a multiplicative norm, but it's not true for this norm. You're like, well, what are other examples of non-multiplicative norms? I don't have any other examples, so relax. <laughs> I mean, there are other examples, but I don't have any other examples for you guys. <clears throat> Gaussian integers. Um, so the Gaussian integers, we define the norm of a plus ib to be a squared plus b squared. That's exactly the, the distance from 0 to a plus ib in the complex plane, right? That's the modulus squared. So this is a particularly beautiful example because we can just make, we can, ana we can analyze the norm in terms of actual geometric distances in the, in the complex plane. So the proof that it's multiplicative is pretty simple. That's not hard to show. That's basically just properties of the complex conjugate as they relate to the modulus squared, whatever. Um, but what's not immediately obvious is the existence of a Euclidean algorithm. In other words, that for every pair of Gaussian integers I pick, a plus ib and c plus id, I can find some other Gaussian integer, let's say q, such that that's pretty close to, um, you know, that q times c plus id is pretty close to a plus ib, and the remainder is smaller than the norm of c plus id. All right, that, that's, I mean, that's what I have to prove in order to prove that there is a division algorithm. But let me just walk you through it. It's actually pretty simple. So what you do, is you're not, you're not alone. I mean, a plus ib and c plus id, yeah, these are Gaussian integers, but these are also complex numbers. So this is just a point in the complex plane. You can divide these two things. It gives you a particular point in the complex plane with rational co co components. a over c plus, well, well I've got to rationalize that stupid thing. But anyway, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, if you work out, rationalize this, you've got c squared plus d squared downstairs, and you've got various ugly combinations of A, B, C, and D upstairs for the real and imaginary components. The point is, it is a particular point in the complex plane. Let's call it Z. Then, if you just think about that, and what does the Gaussian integers look like? The Gaussian integers are this grid of points, right? So if this is Z, that's the quotient. Um, you know, that, that, this is the Z point. That's A plus IB divided by C plus ID. What I do, how do I, how do I construct the quotient? I just pick the closest point in the Gaussian integers, whatever that is. In my silly picture, it would be that point. Um, but anyway, this lands somewhere, and, in, and, and close to that, there are four Gaussian integers that are pretty close, relatively speaking. The center point is the farthest you can get away from all of them. Right? If you go too far up this way, then that's close. And yeah, it's true that that point is further than one half a unit in the vertical or horizontal direction from this guy or that guy or that guy. But if that were the case, then I would just use that as the closest point. So it would be you know, even closer. So basically, the midpoint is sort of the worst case scenario. And that would be when I had a half here and a half here. So what's the distance if I'm in the center point? It's square root of 1 half squared plus 1 half squared, quarter plus a quarter. It's a half. So 1 over the square root of 2 is the maximal distance from, from an interior point to the corner points. Assuming I'm using the closest corner point. I know it's a little <laughs> 
Oh, man, yes. Ah! No, I appreciate that comment. Yes, there is a, um, there's a one here. I, I put it in, in white, though. So, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> anyway, my point is, <laughs> it's, um, it's fairly clear that you can pick a point Q which is less than um, less than one half squared distance away from Z. So what I'm trying to say is, <coughs> so I've got this A plus IB equals Z, and this Q I'm picking as the closest corner point. My point is this stuff right here, right? That stuff right here, I think geometrically, you should be able to see what I was just arguing is that that remainder term divided by C plus ID, that distance squared is less than half. And so what I say is I just say R is equal to, um, R is equal to A plus IB minus Q times C plus ID. I make this the definition of my remainder. That defines the remainder in terms of the closest. How do I pick the closest point in the complex plane? I'm just talking about ordinary complex arithmetic. You actually have to find the rational coordinates of z. But once you do that, it's fairly clear to pick which of the, ration, which of the points with integer coefficients is closest. Just to be less here. How about this one? 3.7 um, plus 4.9i. Pick q. What would you pick? 4 plus 5i. Very good. See? You guys understand it. Now, <clears throat> then the point is, the modulus squared of that is, well, this, this is exactly z minus q times that. I mean, this basically, <clears throat> over here, as I was just saying, r over c plus id is less than 1 over root 2. So squaring that gives me that, well, not squaring that, but this is less than that over 2. But the, this squared is the norm. So the norm of R is less than the norm of C plus I divided by root 2, which is exactly the condition I need. I just need that the norm of R is actually less than the norm of the divisor. And I have that. So there's a proof that this thing I'm sketching, uh, how you do the division algorithm in the Gaussian integers, is, is a legitimate division algorithm. So here's an actual example. You're like, what, with numbers? No way. Yes, with numbers. Um, so suppose I want to take 11 plus 3i and divide by 3i plus 2. You can use the Euclidean algorithm like we did before. Here's a vector format of it. So I start with alpha beta. Here's my, my numerator. Here's my denominator. 3 plus i2, 3, 3i plus 2. I guess most people would write that 2 plus 3i. What's wrong with me? I don't know, many things, but there's one of them. Um, anyway, so next step, you take this and you put it over in the first slot, right? And then what's here is the remainder. Um, so let's see here. So I take alpha, which is again, 11 plus 3i, and I, sub I subtract 2 minus 2i times beta. You're like, where's the 2 minus 2i times beta coming from? I have no earthly idea. Uh, it's been a while since I did this, but um, if you try, 2 minus 2i times beta. What was beta? Oh, man. Did I? <sighs> Son of a gun. Where was that? Oh, stink. This is supposed to be alpha, and that's beta. The w is beta. This is alpha. Um, OK, so. Um, Beta was what? Beta was 3i plus 2. So 2 minus 2i times 3i plus 2. What do we get when we multiply these? I'll distribute 6i plus 4 minus, I mean, plus 6 minus 4i, which is equal to what? Which is equal to 2i plus 10. So versus what? 
11 plus 3i, right? So you can see that the imaginary components within 1 and the real components within 1, that's smaller than the thing I'm dividing by, which was what? The 3i plus 2, right? So that's about as close as you're going to get in terms of a complex multiple of um, 3, 3i plus 2. So that's, that takes some figuring, right? You could use, um, you can actually just do division of complex numbers and figure it out from the rational form of the division what you should choose. Much in the same way that you can figure out remainders from doing the calculator, right? Dividing, subtracting off the integer part and multiplying by the, you know, the dividing number. That'll give you the remainder. You guys know that? Yeah, I hope so. Um, <laughs> or you have a decent calculator, we'll just tell you it anyway. But um, anyway, so that takes some figuring, but there it is. And uh, then you just do it again. How many times can I put um, 1 plus i into 3i plus 2? It seems like, what's that? Twice. Twice, okay. So apparently, yeah. Where did I put that? Twice? You said, you said 2. What would I say here? I said minus i. So uh, minus i times um, i plus 1 gives you 2 minus i, right? Um, so this goes here, right? And then over here we have beta. Oh, apparently I said 3 plus i. So I said 3 plus i times that. Um, 3 plus i times 1 plus i gets me. Um, so I'm, I'm going to subtract th 3 plus i times 1 plus i. But rather than writing 1 plus i here, I wrote what 1 plus i was equal to in terms of alpha and beta, which was this. So once the dust settles here, this gives us minus i is equal to this particular combination of alpha and beta, which when you rearrange it, gives us that minus i is equal to this multiple of beta minus that multiple of alpha. Multiplying that by i gives us this, and that's basically the analog of Bazou's theorem here. This is the complex linear combination of, of alpha and beta, which gives you back 1. Anyway, this might be a little bit mysterious as we're just looking at it, but there, it's really not much different than what you've already done. Um, by the way, if you have two ideals that when you add them together, you get the whole ring, they're said to be co-maximal. So co-maximal ideals are sort of analogous to relatively prime integers. If you have two integers are relatively prime, then the ideals which you generate are the whole integers. If you add the ideals of like three and five together, you get all of Z because one you know, you can get one from a linear, a, a z linear combination of three and five by Bazou's theorem. So consequently, if you look at the sum of the ideal generated by three and the ideal generated by five, you get all the integers. And this story bears out in the more abstract context as well. If you have sort of co-maximal ideals, they're playing the same role in some sense as relatively prime integers do. So that brings us to the story of, um, <clears throat> uh, what's the word? Fermat's last theorem, right? What is Fermat's last theorem? It said that there's no, basically you've got no integer solutions to x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n for n larger than 3. It turns out you can prove that like x cubed plus y cubed equals to z cubed has no solutions by a particular argument in like z adjoining, I think, the square root of minus 3. I won't probably do that in here, but there's like, it's like a pretty gory three-page calculation in John Stilwell's um, Elements and Number Theory book. And so, you know, maybe Euler, one of these guys, Lagrange, found these kinds of arguments to knock down specific ends higher than two. And so this um, lame guy, that's not how you say his name, but he's French, so, you know, whatever. <laughs> Gabriel Lame, I don't know. I'm, I'm missing an accent or something here, but uh, he had this false proof that, you know, of Fermat's last theorem using things like z adjoined square root of five. But his proof basically assumes that we have this unique factorization property for, for these, these, these integers, and that's just not the case. Um, so for, for example, for example, in <clears throat> If you look at z adjoining the square root of minus 5, you can write 46 as 2 times 23, or you can write 46 
as 1 plus 3 times the square root of minus 5 um, times 1 minus 3 the square root of minus 5. These are both, these are irreducible factorizations. In other words, the um, 2, 23, 1 plus root 3 times root minus root 5, and 1 minus 3 times the square root of minus 5, these, these are all irreducibles. And um, so this violates the unique factorization um, property, which is that if you have a, a particular element in the ring and you have two factorizations of it into um, irreducibles, then it should be that the irreducibles are just the same up to their associates. And you can prove that like 2 and these things are not associates. And 23 and these things are not associates. So the, this is, these are inequivalent factorizations into irreducibles in this. And so Lamey's argument used this unique factorization property over things like this. So it's bogus, right? And, you know, um, so it's one of the, you know, one of the more famous uh, false attempts to prove um, for Ma's last theorem. Later in the 19th century, Coomer came along. In fact, Coomer already had shown before um, for Lamey's argument that there was danger of this ambiguity of the factorization, right? So um, he might have figured that out, but he, he didn't know. So anyway, Coomer basically introduced these ideal numbers. Later, Dedekind comes along and he basically crosses the T's and jots the I and so forth of, of, of Coomer's work, and he is able to prove, along with some other people, are able to prove many, many cases of the Fermat's last theorem. All right. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so that brings us to. I mean, Fermat's last theorem is not proved by these things. Ultimately, is something much more um, complicated and recent. But that brings us to basically the next notion, which is unique factorization domain. Um, it's a unique factorization domain if every element can be written as a product of irreducible elements. And if you have two factorizations into irreducible elements, they're, they're the same things, just reordered and associates, associates. Like, I mean, they don't have to be exactly the same thing, but they have the same thing up to associates. So, um, and I think I'm out of time, so. <laughs> but anyway, we're almost on track, believe it or not. Lorenzo's like, 